Hey team, I hope you're having a good summer. My name is Clint Hoagland, and this is Creating Electronic Music with Chuck. In our last video, we looked into the instruments of the SDK and did a deeper dive into one of those instruments, the Banded WG Ugen. In future videos, we'll do deep dives on more Ugens, but in today's video, I want to talk about File I.O., which is short for File Input and Output. This topic is a banger. I am very excited to share with you what I have learned so far about file operations. Reading information out of a text file doesn't seem like a very important or exciting topic, but it unlocks some capabilities that I find very exciting. Because of the wide-ranging possibilities we can explore using File.io, I'm going to break it into two videos. This video is about the input part. Specifically, we're going to look at reading information out of text files and what that buys us creatively. In a later video, we'll look into writing information into text files using Chuck and why we might want to do that. So, okay, let's see how to open a text file. Here, I have written some words into a text file, which I have saved under the file name hello.txt. I made the file in VS Code, but you could do it in Notepad or any other text editor. So how do we open this file up in Chuck? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an object of a type called file.io. I'm going to call mine io. This object lets you interact with a file on disk. To select that file, I'm going to type io.open and put in two parameters. The first one is the file name. This file is in the same directory as my Chuck file, so I can just ask for hello.txt. The second parameter is the file access mode. You can open files for reading, for writing, or for both. In this case, I just want to read the file, so I'm going to specify file.io.read, and then close my parentheses. Now I'm going to chuck the result of this into an int called success, and I'm going to print success to the console. If I run this script, it shows a 1. That's the number that corresponds to true, which means that opening the file succeeded. If I were to try to read a file that didn't exist, for instance, that would return a 0, which is the number for false. Okay, I switched my file name back to the correct one, and we can see that the file read succeeded. What can we now do with this file? Let's try chucking IO into a string, which I've called display. And let's print that to the console. Before I run this, try to guess what's going to print to my console. Okay, I run it, and this is what printed my console. It's just the first word in my text file. If I chuck IO into my string variable again and display that, I get the next word. What the file IO Ugen does is, it chops up the text file into what we'll call tokens. The tokens are separated by spaces. The I.O. object then holds an array of those tokens and waits for you to ask for them. So if I chuck I.O. into a string, it gives me back the first token, and then it moves to the next one. If I chuck it into a string a second time, it gives me back the second token. I can keep doing this again and again until I run out of tokens. There's a helper function called .eof, which tells you whether you're out of tokens, which you can use like this. I'll make a while loop that will keep going as long as eof isn't true, and then it will exit. So that outputs the entire contents of the file. There's also another file I.O. function called readline. If I chuck that into a string, that uses line breaks to chop up the, the tokens, so each token is one line from the file. This will be important later on, but for now, let's stick to using spaces to separate our tokens. So we've seen that tokens can be chucked into strings, but it's also possible to chuck tokens into ints or floats. Here's a file containing a bunch of ints, all separated by spaces. If I change the type of the variable I'm chucking into, then it will read these numbers as ints from the file. Note that these have been chucked in as ints and not as string tokens. This is important because, as we know, in chuck we can use numbers for stuff. Here I've created a signal chain that wires up a SINOSC to an ADSR and on into the DAC. I set my envelope like so, and then I make my file IO object. I open my file into my file IO object, and then I iterate across the file IO using this while loop. Note that this looks a little different. If you chuck a file IO into a variable, that will return a 1 if it succeeds and a 0 if it's reached the end of the file. This means you can use an IO like this instead of using the EOF function. So I'm printing the value of the int to the console, and then I use our same usual stuff to chuck that int into the oscillator's frequency. I kick the envelope and chuck some time into now. We can use the contents of our text file to drive the pitch of our oscillator. Here is another text file. This one also contains only ints. Notice that I have the ints paired off. This is because the first member of each pair is the pitch, and the second member of each pair is the note length. Here is some code that can parse that file. As you can see, it's pretty much like the other file. The only differences are that this one does use the end of file marker, and this one takes two ints for every pass through the while loop. The first one is the note, and the second one is a divisor. I use the divisor to chop up a bar into quarters, eighths, and sixteenth notes. 
So this is what I find exciting, and here's why. This makes straightforward something that is generally not that straightforward in Chuck. It's not particularly simple in Chuck just to write out a melody if that melody has any variety in its rhythm. Let's add in a third argument to our note parser. This time, I'm going to chuck IO into a float, and I'm going to use that to control the oscillator's gain. Then I just add another column onto my text file. So you can see it was really straightforward to add dynamics to my melody in this fashion. You could use the same technique to attach any kind of value to your notes. Try it with filter cutoff, or pan, or decay length. Go nuts. I do want to point out one more useful feature of the file IO object before we move on. As you can see here, I've chucked zero into its seek method. The seek method lets you choose the token that will be chosen next. By choosing the first token, which has an ID of zero, I can cause the IO to jump back to the beginning, which makes this into a loop. So, this here is essentially a part that can be played by a chuck file. You could chain a number of these together to make a longer composition, or you could just make the part file longer. However, I'm looking at this, and it's missing two things that I think would really help me. I want to be able to make a comment, and I want a non-hacky way to put in a rest. For those listening who aren't musicians, a rest is a moment in your part where you don't play anything. They don't get a pitch, but they do get a note length. So, the way I want to do this is I want to be able to start a comment with a double slash, and I want to be able to put in an R instead of a note number to specify a rest. If you're only reading ints out of a file I.O. object, your Chuck script is just going to exit when it reaches something that's not an int. That's not allowed. I asked about this on the Chuck Facebook group, and I got an answer from none other than Perry Cook, author of the C++ SDK. Shouts to that guy. He asked if I knew about something called the string tokenizer. I did not know about the string tokenizer because it is not documented in the Chuck book, nor is it referenced anywhere in the online documentation. The only place it does show up is in the example files that come with the Chuck distribution. In the string directory, there's a file called token.ck. Here's what's in that file. It's very simple. It's got an object called a string tokenizer, and it's got a set function that takes a string. Now, here we've got a while loop that says, while there are more somethings, print the object's dot next property to the console. If we run this, we can see that it cut that string into three tokens and then printed each one to the console. From this, we can infer that the dot more property returns that there are more tokens to return, and the dot next function passes us the next token. This means that this string tokenizer object really lets you treat a string the way a file IO object treats a file. Here I've written a part file that has the features that I want. It starts with a comment, and then it has a mixture of notes and rests, and the notes and rests themselves specify the pitch and the length of each note. Let's take a minute to examine this line by line. The first line is a comment. I start the comment with two slashes. In a chuck file, that becomes a comment because it's part of the language, but this file is not a chuck file, so I will need to make that happen when I parse the file. Our next line is just a regular note. It's got a note number and a note length. We were able to handle that pretty much automatically when we were just parsing the file into ints. Hopefully that remains straightforward, but we'll see. The next line after that is a rest. It starts with an R, and then there's a note length. Then the rest of the lines are just variations on those three things. Everything in this file is either a comment, a rest, or a note. It's important to observe that each of those is on its own line. So now let's look at a file that can play that part. Let's look at this line by line as well. The first line is the signal chain. The second line sets up the ADSR. On line 4, we make a file I.O. object, and on line 5, we make a string tokenizer. On line 6, we open up the file that has the lines we want to read. We set up our beat time and make a default offset. Then we have this infinite while loop, which contains a second while loop. The inner loop will terminate when io.more returns false. That more function is essentially the opposite of the eof function. It evaluates the true if you haven't chewed through the whole file yet. Then we read a line from the file and stash it in a string variable. Then our loop has a decision to make. As we said, there are three kinds of lines in the file. Comments, rests, and notes. The way we're going to find out which is which is... Strings have a find function that returns the position of a string inside another string. So were I to, say, have a string called clint, if I did a clint.find for the letters in, then it would return a 2, because in would be at the 0, 1, 2 position inside clint. In this case, we want to know if the line string starts with a double slash, an r, or neither of those. So we use line.find to see if there's a double slash at position 0, and if so, we'll treat that line as a comment. If it's an r, we'll treat it as a rest, and otherwise we'll treat it as a note. Once we run out of lines, we fall out of the inner loop, at which point we set the file I.O. object back to the first token and repeat the whole thing. Now, you probably noticed that the actual processing of these lines takes place elsewhere. I've created a helper function for each of my line types. The process comment function just prints the line to the console. 
The process rest function hands the line to the string tokenizer, then it chucks the first token into a string. Then it takes the second token, converts it from alpha to int, and chucks that into an int. We print that to the console, and then advance according to the divisor that we put in the int. The process note function is like the process rest function, except it converts both the first and second token into ints, and then it uses the first int to get the oscillator's frequency. All right, let's give this a rip. And if we take a look at the console output, you can see that it printed out my comment, it printed out the notes when the notes played, and it printed out the rests when the rests played. So that's all pretty cool, but let's try one more thing. I've added another helper function called process extras and put it into my note processing function. That actually takes the string tokenizer. Recall that the tokenizer will tell you if it's got more tokens to process. That means that we can just add arbitrary arguments onto the backs of our notes. As you can see here, the process extras function just sees if there are any more tokens after the note and the note length. If there are any, then it checks to see if they start with P, F, or Q. If they do, then it just lops off the first character of the token and then chucks what's left into a float and then changes either the pan position, the low pass frequency, or the low pass resonance. I added those into the signal chain while I was testing this out. So try to imagine what my part file looks like if I'm using what I'm calling here extras. So as you can see, I have now added a F extra here, which is for the uh, low pass frequency, and a Q of one, which is the resonance. And then I got my rest still. And then I changed the resonance to four here. I changed the pan and the filter frequency on these notes. I changed the filter frequency again on this note, and then changed the pan back to the center right here. Changed the Q to one briefly, changed the Q to two here and then change it to eight here, and then I've made this note drop down to, so that it sounds cooler. And then I, so I sort of sweep up the filter as we play these last four 16th notes. And this is all handled by our new process extras function. And I'll, uh, this is what it sounds like. And if you are the type of person that would rather see things in neater columns, uh, tabs work just fine. The tokenizer treats tabs like spaces. So here I've used tabs instead of spaces to separate my different uh, my note from my note length from my extras and they're made nicer columns. I probably wouldn't do that myself, but if you feel like doing that, that is uh, supported by the tokenizer. So, as we've demonstrated, using a combination of a Chuck script and a part file, we can create whatever format we want to enter notes or other musical events in our music. Note entry is one aspect of Chuck that I personally found a little daunting, but using this technique, it's actually very simple and powerful. In this video, we discussed reading from text files and how you can use that in Chuck to make it simple to write melodies. In our next video, I'm going to explain a little more basic music theory for those who are wondering how to pick the MIDI note numbers for their melodies.